I'm so glad to be with you today and that you're joining me as we take a look at God's Word today and what He has to say about the return of Jesus Christ, looking specifically today at uh, the tribulation and the rapture. Um, I'm looking forward to being uh, together with you in person uh, very soon. Uh, just this last week, the church board met on Tuesday, and I'll have an announcement about that at the end of um, the message this morning. So I would encourage you to stick around uh, for that announcement uh, at that time. But this week, I've been spending time in Psalm 46, and I shared uh, a little bit of this with the church board on Tuesday night. And uh, also, if you uh, happen to read my devotional uh, that I wrote that's on our webpage on Wednesday, you would have seen um, some of that. But Psalm 46 uh, says this in verses 6 and 7 and 10. The nations are in chaos, and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders, and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. And I thought about that uh, this week, that it's almost to the point for me sometimes where I don't want to watch uh, the news anymore because there's just so much uh, so much chaos. The nations are in chaos and the, the kingdoms are crumbling. There's 36 million people now unemployed uh, in our country in just the last two months. Um, and that, that's not to mention the rest of the world and what's going on there. Um, there are experts on both sides of the issue that are saying, you know, this pandemic is, you know, the worst thing ever. And others are saying it's not that bad. We have to get out and do something versus we have to stay in for the next year and a half. I mean, you've got all these conflicting ideas and reports. Um, we have politicians who want to fund and keep uh, abortion clinics open and, and keep liquor stores open and keep, um, you know, marijuana stores open as essential. Uh, but then are not willing to concede on other issues, especially uh, in some cities and some states with churches and things like that. And so you have the lies and the deception. You've got the corruption going on at you know, the FBI and other places like that. And all of these things taking place. And it just seems like there's so much chaos, so much turmoil in our world. But we're reminded when we put our hearts and our focus on Scripture, like it says in Psalm 46, to be still to think about, to know that he is God, to put our faith and our trust in him. He is our fortress. I kind of thought of it as like when I taught our kids to swim. You're in the midst of the pool, the water's deep. Um, it's kind of chaotic. It's splashing everywhere and waves and things like that. And yet in the midst of all that, were our kids afraid? No. Were they willing to jump off the side of the pool and into our arms? Of course they were. And why is that? Because we were there. Because we were there as parents to protect them and to help them. And in the same way, in the midst of the chaos and the turmoil of our world, uh, God is right there with you to watch over you, protect you. You do not need to be afraid of everything that's going on. You do not need to fear in these days. And I want to encourage you with that, to be strong, to be bold, to be confident in the Lord, to, to know that he's our rock, our fortress, our refuge, and our helper. And I hope that that's a huge encouragement as we begin today uh, in the midst of what's going on in our world. But I want to turn our attention now to two very important teachings of the Bible, and that is the rapture and the tribulation. And let me just say again, just as a way of, of beginning, um, we need to understand that Scripture and reading and understanding Scripture requires interpretation. We have to apply our ability of interpreting Scripture uh, whenever we read it. And most of the Bible, all Christians will agree on what most of the Bible is trying to say and on the essential doctrines and our belief in God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, and uh, salvation, those things, those are all essentials. But when it comes to the end times, when it comes to things like the rapture, um, there are some different ways of viewing that. There, there are Christians who see this issue in different ways. And I want to let you know that at the very beginning, when, from the outset, that it's okay if you come to a different conclusion than the one that, that I have and that many other people have come, come to. It's not a salvation issue. And so we don't have to believe exactly the same on that uh, to, to be saved and have faith in Jesus Christ. But I want to share with you what, what many, many Christians, what many Bible scholars, what many theologians, what many teachers uh, would agree on is the meaning of uh, these passages as they relate to um, the end times, as they relate to the prophecies concerning uh, the return of Christ and the, the period that's called the tribulation. 
And I want to share with you my understanding of what those those things are. Uh, but before we look at that, there's something that I promised the last couple weeks that I want us to take just a moment to look at. You'll find it in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 36. And you can uh, you can turn there and look at that another time. But it's just a very short verse. And it's in this thing called the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus was teaching on the Mount of Olives. And part of that discussion was about the end times. And he said this, and we've looked at this the last couple of weeks. He said in part of that, verse 36, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now you can understand, and, and many have understandably taken this to mean that we simply can't know when Jesus will return. And so they take that to mean, why should we even try to understand? But I want to share with you this morning uh, something a little bit different, something that I've found from uh, careful reading. And I'm not trying to be uh, just trying to be different. I'm not trying to be kind of have an out there uh, view of things. But I want to share with you something that I've uh, discovered in my reading uh, that I think is really helpful and important. Again, it says no one knows. And many will read that to mean that we, we simply just can't know. But this is where studying the original languages and studying the Greek uh, text of the scripture can be very helpful to us to understand exactly and interpret well what's going on there. Uh, so in the New Testament Greek, which is called Koine Greek, there are uh, a whole lot of different ways that you can uh, write a verb. Okay, So in English, we have several different forms of verbs, but, but in Koine Greek, it's a massive number <laughs> of verbs. There's like uh, so many different forms and so many different tenses. And uh, for instance, when I was in uh, college, I did really well in Greek when we were studying all the nouns and all those things and pronouns. Uh, I was getting a great grade. But when we got to, pron or when we got to verbs, uh, my grade uh, went down uh, because it was so difficult just to wrap my mind around the way all of those uh, verb forms have to match an agreement and what they mean and all that. So when we come to, to Greek, um, it, the word in this passage here in, in verse 36, the word for knows, which is a verb, how we know something, um, no one knows. The word there is oiden in Greek. And it's written in what's called the perfect indicative active form. The perfect indicative active form. Uh, nearly all translations will translate this, just as we read today in the New International Version, uh, translates as no one knows. But there is one translation that translates this a little closer to what I believe the original Greek is trying to say there. Uh, that's the Young's literal translation, which says this, no one hath known. No one hath known the day or the hour. That's because the perfect indicative active form of a verb describes an action which has been completed and which is being completed uh, up to that point. In other words, uh, what has happened is complete to that point and continues to be complete. That's the perfect indicative active. The perfect, which is the completed action, they have not known. The active, which is the subject acting, is that no one is knowing. And then the indicative is that it's truly a real reality. It actually has happened. So no one has known up to this point. This means that the literal translation of that word, oiden, the literal translation is no one has known or is now knowing. No one has known or is now knowing. In other words, Jesus is not saying that uh, no one knows or will ever know in the future. He's saying that no one has known or is now currently knowing when that hour is going to be. In other words, I believe that we can read this with the understanding of what Jesus means here is that as we get nearer to the last days, as we get closer, that there will be events and signs that will help us see more clearly that the day and the hour are approaching. Just think of it again as if you're on a trip and you're going somewhere and uh, someone said, you know, you're going to pass this town, or you're going to pass this city and you're going to look for this mile marker and you're going to look for this exit. Then you're going to look for this building on the right and you're going to look for this on the left and then you're going to see this. And so as you would travel along that, you don't know exactly what time you're going to be there. You don't know exactly what it might look like, especially if you've never been there before. But as you get closer, as you pass those signs and events, I don't think Jesus is saying you can't possibly know anything about it. I think he's saying that no one has known up to this point, only those who are living at that time and who are seeing these things take place and seeing these signs and seeing these events will then begin to understand we are getting very, very close to that day and to that hour. 
So that's why he says in verse 42, which by the way, in verse 42, uh, he says, you're not currently knowing. It's the same, uh, same word there, the same form of that verb. Uh, Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have not let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Literally, when you are not now presently expecting him. The second person present active and indicative. So I think we can have some confidence when it comes to uh, seeing signs and seeing the events that are taking place to understand that we may be nearing the time. That's why it's so important for us to spend time in God's word, learning about these things, not just in time with me, but that you would do that on your own uh, with uh, in your own study, in your own time. And so these last few weeks have been simply just an attempt to help you begin to get a grasp on and to understand what some of the things that are happening in our world now and as they may uh, relate to uh, the return of Jesus, uh, his second coming to our world. Just as Romans 13, 11 says, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And so we know that day is approaching. Every day is another day closer to the return of Jesus. But there are two things that will happen before Jesus' second coming. And I want to share those. The first one is this. The first one is the rapture. And that is the time when Christians will be caught up to be with Jesus and to go to be with him in heaven. The second one is um, immediately after that is the beginning of the seven year tribulation on earth. It's a period of God's judgment and wrath being poured out on evil and wickedness in our world. And I want to look at these in reverse order. So I want to look at the tribulation first, and then I want to look at what's called uh, the rapture and see what the Bible has to say about that. Now, at the beginning of the message today, um, I talked about a world in chaos and turmoil. And maybe you've heard people asking this, and I've heard people asking, is this the apocalypse? Is this the end times? Is this the, the period that we need to be looking for when Jesus is going to be returning? And I can say to you, absolutely no. Although we're closer now than ever, uh, the, the tribulation is something that takes place after uh, the rapture. And after all, some of these other signs have to first take place. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, uh, Jesus describes the coming time of tribulation this way. And I want you to turn there with me. It's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. I've got to begin at verse 21. He says this, For there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And then in Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, And there shall be a time of trouble such as has not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. If we look at the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19, we see there a description of these events that Jesus and, and the book of Daniel are referencing. Uh, we see that the tribulation there in much greater detail. And we're not going to go through all of that, you know, verse by verse right now. We can't possibly do that. But I want to give a summary of what takes place there. And one of the main things we read and we need to know is that the tribulation is a time of great trouble. That's what the word tribulation means. And it's a time when God's wrath is ultimately poured out in judgment upon the evil of this world, upon a world that has rejected Christ, has rejected him, has rejected his offer of salvation, has shaken its fist in his face and said, we don't want anything to do with you. We want to do our own thing. And so the God, the creator of the world that loved us so much that he sent his son to die in our place, all those who reject that ultimately reject God, his wrath and his judgment will be poured out upon the earth during the great tribulation. Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, describes the tribulation judgment in this way. It says this, It's the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. God's judgment, his fury, the fury of his wrath poured out upon the earth. And leading up to this pouring out of his wrath are a whole series of events that take place uh, on the earth as well as in the earth, and the, the elements themselves, uh, a horrific and unimaginable events that, that happen in the earth. And that's what takes place there in Revelation chapter 6, 
uh, through chapter 19 that we see there. And so we don't have time to go into great detail about the tribulation, but a few things that we know about that that'll take place. First of all, we know that the tribulation period will begin with a peace treaty between the nation of Israel and the surrounding nations uh, that will be led by the Antichrist. If we look at Daniel's, gospel, or Daniel's book, uh, chapter 9, verse 27, it says this, He, the Antichrist, or the ruler at that time, will confirm a covenant or a peace treaty, some sort of treaty, uh, with many for a period of seven years. In the middle of that seven years, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering, and at the temple he will set up an abomination that desecrates the temple until the end that is decreed for him and that is poured out upon him until he is ultimately judged. So again, going back to the sign of last week, we know that the Jews will be a nation again. We know that Israel will be in existence at that time and will be in conflict uh, with its neighbors. And we know that at some point there will be a seven-year peace agreement that is agreed upon. The Antichrist is going to bring all is going to be a part of signing this peace agreement, brokering maybe between the two or or leading some of these nations that have been at war and enemies with. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. But Israel and its neighbors will agree upon this, and the Antichrist will be a part of that. And during this time, Israel will build or will have built uh, a third temple. They've built two before. They've both been destroyed. They're going to build a third temple. And then they're going to be resuming the sacrifices, the Old Testament sacrifices for the sins of the people. Remember that Jews are not, uh, they don't believe in Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for our sins that God sent to cover the whole world. And so they're going to go back to the Old Testament and perform the sacrifices again. Well, at some point, halfway through, the Antichrist, or Revelation, the book of Revelation calls him the beast, is going to go in there. He's going to stop the sacrifices, and he's going to perform some sort of sacrifice or something within the temple on the altar that desecrates the temple before them all, desecrates them before God. And that is going to be performed uh, a beginning period of the second part of the tribulation. The tribulation is seven years. It's split into two halves. First three and a half years, there's going to be these sacrifices going on, uh, this false peace. And then at that halfway point, the Antichrist comes in, desecrates the temple, leading to the second half of the tribulation where great judgments and wrath is poured out. We see this in Matthew's gospel. We see this in the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, and 2 Thessalonians. And so you can look in those places. The Antichrist is a human through whom Satan acts on the earth during the tribulation. He's called the Antichrist because he opposes everything that God is about. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, uh, which is speaking, uh, Paul is speaking there about Jesus' second coming. He says this, That day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness, again, another term for the Antichrist, until the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And then it goes on in First Thess Second Thessalonians chapter 2, this is verses 8 through 10. And then the lawless one, again, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his second coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil desire that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And we get more description of the Antichrist and, and, and the things that he will perform uh, in the book of Revelation, chapters 13 and chapter 17. Some of the things that we see there are that he it seems that he will be given power over all the people on earth. He will, he will be given great power to rule on earth uh, for those second three and a half years of the tribulation. Uh, he will, um, the people who are not Christians living at that time will worship him. Uh, the Bible says those who have not don't have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's another way of saying those who believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, they will they will be deceived and they will worship him. Uh, it seems that maybe there will be an assassination attempt on his life. It says that there in, in chapter 13 that he has a fatal wound upon his head uh, from which he is healed. Um, and then we also see that he has a religious leader uh, that will come up alongside him. It's, it's the second beast, uh, which is called a false prophet. And this, this uh, false prophet forces people to worship the Antichrist. Uh, he performs deceptive miracles that deceive people. They look 
powerful and amazing, but he deceives people with those deceptive miracles. And then he forces people to take a mark of some sort on their right hand and on, or on their forehead, some sort of mark. And they use that mark uh, to control people so that they can neither buy nor sell uh, anything. You can't get anything unless you have the mark of the beast upon your forehead or upon your hand. And we talked a little bit about last week what that some things that could possibly look like. We just simply don't know exactly what that's going to be. Next week, we're going to look a little bit more closely at what is going to happen uh, at the end of time during God's judgment uh, to the Antichrist and, and to the false prophet. Uh, but this week, I'm going to look a little bit more closely now, moving along, uh, to look at what about the terrible judgments that are going to be taking place upon the earth during that time. Revelation says that there will these, these judgments will come through seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials. And these are symbolic of these judgments being uh, either opened, as in a seal being opened, uh, trumpets like a pronouncement, or, or bowls or vials where they're poured out uh, the judgments upon the earth. Revelation chapter 6 uh, describes these seven first seven seals that are opened and judgments poured out. It says this, that the, the first four seals, seal one through four, um, are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, some of you might be familiar with that. It's a terminology they use um, at the University of Notre Dame. But these are not any four horsemen that you would ever want to meet. These four horsemen represent uh, war, famine, pestilence, and death. And so the seals, as they're open, those first four are going to pour out war, famine, pestilence, and death upon the earth. The fifth seal, as it's open, is the death of the Christian martyrs uh, who are alive at that time. These are not uh, Christians who were raptured, who, who, who are caught up to be with the Lord in the rapture. These are people who were not believers at the beginning of the tribulation uh, before the rapture, who come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior during the uh, the time of the tribulation, whether it's through discovering God's word and reading that, whether it's through uh, uh, those who would who would teach at that time and they come to a discovery of a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, but these these are people who are believers and Christians who are alive at that time, not those who were taken up in the rapture. Uh, but they are going to be they are going to die for their faith, and so they will be martyrs and witnesses uh, of faith in Jesus Christ at that time. The sixth seal is a massive earthquake that literally shakes the entire globe. And this earthquake will cause uh, the sun to be darkened, the moon to be blood red, uh, the stars to fall. We don't know if those are asteroids or what that might look like, but there will be these cataclysmic events, uh, both in an earthquake on the earth as well as in the sky at that time. And then comes the seventh seal. As that seventh seal is open, the seventh seal is opens and there are seven angels then who come blowing seven trumpets. And each of these trumpets represents another stage uh, or another uh, judgment that's poured out on the earth. And we read about these seven trumpets in Revelation chapter 8 uh, through Revelation chapter 11. The first trumpet will be uh, a trumpet that unleashes uh, hail mixed with fire and blood upon the earth. Now, I can't even begin to imagine. I mean, we've had a couple of thunderstorms here this last week, um, lightning and heavy rain. I cannot even begin to imagine uh, hail mixed with fire and blood pouring down upon the earth. And it says that, that as that comes down, a third of the earth, the vegetation upon the earth is burned. That's the first trumpet. Uh, the next trumpet is it says something like a giant mountain which was on fire was cast into the sea and a third of all ocean life is destroyed and dies. The third trumpet that blows says that the stars will fall from the sky and poison one-third of the water on the earth. Again, we don't know exactly what these things represent or what they will be, but something will fall from the sky, poisoning the water uh, that people drink so that they can no longer drink it. Uh, the fourth trumpet then is where a third of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. Again, we don't know exactly what that looks like or what that means, but, but a third of the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars will be darkened. The fourth trumpet then are locusts that come out. A star crashes to earth and locusts come out of this abyss and they, they are given power to torment people, but they are not given power to kill people. And so people will be tormented uh, by these terrible uh, locusts or some sort of creature, uh, but not to the point of death. And so people will suffer excruciatingly as a result of, of this, uh, particularly er, and specifically those uh, who do not have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, who do not worship Jesus Christ. 
And then there's the sixth trumpet. And I mentioned this a little bit last week, the sixth trumpet war. Uh, that is a battle in which a third of humankind dies in this battle. And so there's these, these uh, seven seals that are opened of judgment, these uh, seven trumpets that are blown. We've read the sixth. And then, shockingly, after these trumpets and these seals, we read this in Revelation chapter 9, verses tw beginning at verse 20. It says, The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Now, it's unbelievable to me. I, I can't comprehend how they can experience uh, these uh, terrible things, and yet their hearts are so wicked, so full of hatred for God, that even though they see his judgment being poured out, they will not turn to him. And so the seals, the trumpets, the seventh trumpet then uh, is blown, and this is in chapter 11, beginning at verse 15 and following, and it, it announces a great song of praise in heaven to God. The trumpet blows and there's this great praise that the 24 elders that are there and all those gathered around lift up God the Father in praise. And we go on from there uh, in Revelation chapter 15 through chapter 16, and we it, it, it talks more about more judgments poured out on the earth called the seven bowls or the seven vials that are poured out there. And you can read those. I'm not going to go through each one, but a couple I want to highlight. The first is the sixth bowl, uh, and that is the Battle of Armageddon. And so you've certainly heard of that. People use it all the time in popular culture, you know, Armageddon or the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, this is literally the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, and here in this this final battle, of good versus evil uh, will take place upon the earth, and all the nations uh, will come against Israel. And when it looks like there will be no way out, uh, God will deliver the nation of Israel from its enemies and defeat the armies of earth. And then finally, the seventh bowl that is poured out is the final judgment. Uh, Revelation says against Babylon, and Babylon simply represents the uh, the, the political and religious uh, ways of the world. Uh, the way that the world operates politically and rel religiously. And, and so there's going to be judgment poured out on a, a world that has turned its back on God as the seventh bowl is poured out in judgment upon the world. It's truly an unimaginable time. It's truly something that, that we cannot simply uh, wrap our minds around and even understand the terror, the death, and the punishment that, that's there. And no one in their right mind would want to go through this. Nobody is going to want it. Nobody would want to go through that. But sadly, billions of people on the earth are going to go through this. There are billions of people, maybe alive today, or maybe at some point in the near future, who are going to be alive, who are going to live through and experience the horrors of the tribulation. But that leads us to the second part of the message today. I said we we're going to talk about the, the tribulation and the rapture. And those are in reverse order. Uh, and there are many different views on the rapture. Some people think that the rapture will take place uh, halfway through the tribulation. Some people think it will take place, you know, three quarters of the way through. Some people think the rapture of the church will take place at the end of the tribulation. But the, the view that I uh, firmly subscribe to and that, that many, many Bible teachers and scholars, pastors believe, uh, is, and historically looking back through scripture and through history, is that there is something called the pre-tribulation rapture. There is a rapture that happens before all of these events that are described in Daniel and Matthew's gospel through Jesus and Luke and Luke 21, Mark 13, uh, and, and the books of Re book of Revelation. If we remember from a few weeks ago, uh, a discussion that, that we had, I shared with you, um, going back all the way to Easter, and I've shared it a couple different times, uh, about a Galilean uh, marriage and everything that went into that. And we talked about the parallels between Jesus' ministry and his second coming and that Galilean marriage. And if you remember, uh, the groom would go to the bride before um, before they were married, and he would make a proposal uh, to the bride. He would propose a covenant to her, which would then be sealed by the drinking of a cup that he would offer to her. And she drank that cup that sealed the covenant between the two. And then it, the, in the Galilean marriage, the groom then would go. They wouldn't be married immediately then, 
But he would go off for a period of at least a year where he would go back to his, his family's home, to his father's home, and he would either add on to the home or if he was wealthy enough, could build their own home. But he would go and, and build a, a home for him and his bride. And he said that he would then come back uh, at the end of that period uh, when it was time to gather his bride to go to be with him, and they would go and live in that uh, that home that he had built. Well, if you remember from John's Gospel, chapter 14, uh, Jesus describes this very thing. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you with me so that you may also be where I am. Now, I don't know about you, but does it sound right to you that a loving groom, a groom that's excited to be married to his bride, a groom that has made a covenant, a groom that has laid down his life and is eagerly anticipating being together with his bride, that if any loving groom like that, before he would let her go to get her and celebrate their wedding, would first make her go through a prolonged period of horrific anguish and suffering? Of course not. No groom would do that. I read just at the beginning of this message uh, from Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, uh, and, and listen to what the second part of that verse says. I just read the first part earlier, but listen to the second part. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says, There will be a time of tribulation such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Again, Jesus was re referencing this in Matthew's gospel, chapter 24. There will not be a time of tribulation. There will be a time of tribulation such as not been from the beginning. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is written in the book, again, that Lamb's book of life, they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Everyone whose name is written in the book will be delivered. There's coming a time of great tribulation, but everybody who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will be delivered. In other words, the groom is going to come to receive his bride to take her. In uh, the Apostle Paul, in, in uh, the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 13, he says, We wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a glorious hope. It's something we're looking forward to. It's something we're eagerly awaiting. We're looking forward to his glorious appearing. Now, that doesn't sound anything like uh, if those who would say we're going to go through the tribulation period. Instead, they're looking forward to that his appearing. When the groom comes back for his bride, the Apostle Paul writes about this again in uh, the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. In chapter 1, he is giving thanks uh, to the Thessalonians for their great faith, their faith which uh, many people have heard of and many people have told him about how, their, how great their faith was. And so he's praising them for their faith and following Jesus. And then he says this in chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. He's talking about those who are testifying about their great faith. He says, They tell how you turned to God away from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. They're waiting. They're looking forward to the Son coming back from heaven, who is going to rescue them from the coming wrath. Now think about this. If the time of tribulation is God's wrath poured out, on those who have rejected him, does it make any sense that believers who have put their faith and trust in him, who are who are under his protection and under his, his blood and under his um, salvation, would go through the wrath? It doesn't even line up with scripture. Those, uh, they put their faith and trust in Jesus who rescues them from the coming wrath. That doctrine is called the doctrine of the rapture. When believers in Christ are caught up to meet him in the air, to go to be with him and to be with the Father in his Father's house, just as he said he would in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Now, this word rapture, it's not a word that's in uh, the Bible. You're not going to look through uh, the Bible, Old or New Testament, and find that word in, in, in the English Bible. You're not going to find that word uh, rapture. It's not a Greek word either. 
the word rapture comes from the Latin translation of the Greek Bible, and it was a, it was a Latin word, uh, repare, and that's where we get the word rapture. But the Greek word that, that rapture points to is the Greek word harpazo, and it means literally to be caught up. Harpazo in Greek, to be caught up. And so we read of this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And here the Apostle Paul uh, was writing to Christians in Thessalonica, the same book that we read from just a minute ago, uh, who were looking forward to seeing Jesus. This They were waiting for the Son from heaven, remember, to escape the wrath. Uh, they were looking forward to seeing Jesus when he returned, if they were alive at that time. But here was their concern. They were going, during, going through a period of intense persecution, and so they were concerned. They knew that if they were alive, they would see Jesus when he returned, but they wondered about those who had already died. Would they also go uh, to see Jesus? Would they be caught up to see him when he returned? And so the Apostle Paul is writing to, uh, to encourage them and to let them know that, yes, they would go to see him. And so this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I want to encourage you to pause it for just a moment. Maybe you want to turn there in your Bible. And it says this, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. In other words, those who have died uh, before you. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. In other words, those who have died in him, who, who believed in him before they died. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who... Who have fallen asleep. In other words, we're not going to go up before them. Uh, those who are asleep, it says in verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. In other words, you don't have to be worried. Those who have died are still going to meet the Lord. In fact, they will rise up before you to go to be with him. And it'll just be instantaneously, but they are going to rise first from their graves to be resurrected with the Lord. And then it goes on, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. Caught up there is the Greek word harpazo. Literally, we will be caught up, or the Latin translation, we will be raptured up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Harpazo, raptured, caught up, to be with the Lord in the air, to go to be with him in his father's house. Now there's one more piece of evidence that I want to share with you. One more word of encouragement. And we find this in Luke's gospel, uh, chapter 17, verses 26 through 29. And this is describing again, uh, those end times, that, those, that period uh, of tribulation and just before the tribulation. Uh, this, these is, this is Jesus' words in chapter 17. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. And so what was it about those days? Yes, there was great wickedness. We read there in Scripture, in, in, in Genesis, as well as uh, when, when Jesus said, and said there was great wickedness uh, upon the face of the earth during the times of Noah. And of course, we know that during the days of, of Lot in the, in the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah, great evil and wickedness there, uh, great sexual immorality, homosexuality, and other things taking place. And so God's judgment was going to be poured out in the days of Noah, poured out upon the earth, and upon, upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, but what we see in both of these accounts is not only judgment, but also grace, the grace of God. We read that, that there were, in both accounts, there were faithful and obedient people on the earth at that point. In the days of Noah, uh, Noah and his family were faithful and obedient. And so God, what did he do? He placed them in the ark and he lifted them literally upon the floodwaters, lifted them, saved them, preserved them uh, away from uh, the judgment that he poured out, literally <laughs> the waters consumed and covered the earth, that he poured up, out upon the earth. 
God lifted Noah and his family and saved them from that judgment. And the same thing in the in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, with the, with Lot and his family. Uh, God literally sent two angels to the city and, and told Lot and his wife and his family they needed to leave. And he they led them out of the town. They they took them out of the place. And then God's judgment was poured down upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so as it says there in verse twenty six, just as it was in the days of Noah so it shall be at the day of the coming of the Son of Man, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we see, Paul says, encourage one another with, these, with this good news, that just as in those days when God took those who were faithful and obedient to him, and he preserved them from the judgment that was going to be poured out upon the earth, I believe from Scripture from many other passages we read, that God will rapture his church. They will be caught up, harpazo, to meet him in the air, the groom returning in, in excitement for his bride to take her to be with him away from the judgment that will then be poured out upon the earth. That is good news. That is our hope. That is what we are looking forward to. Paul says, encourage each other with these words. Listen. The pandemic we're going through right now, it's its its a bad thing, you know. It's caused a lot of pain in our world, uh, of both physical and death, as well as economic, and going to cause a lot more economic hardship and pain. But this is nothing at all. This pales in comparison to the tribulation which will be poured out upon an unbelieving, uh, God-hating world at some point. Uh, but the good news of the gospel is that you and I do not have to go through the tribulation. We don't have to go through that. We don't have to experience that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and live for him. And I want to share with you how you can do that. I've shared with you each week. It's the ABC of salvation. It's very simple. The ABCs. The A simply stands for to admit that you have sinned and need God's forgiveness. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us have done wrong things uh, that we need forgiven of, wrong things that separate us from God and separate us from other. And so we need God's forgiveness. We admit that we need his forgiveness. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have to admit that. Then second is B, we believe that Jesus Christ is God's son who died for our sins. And by putting our faith and trust in him, our sins are forgiven and we're reconciled to God. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one only Son, that whoever believes in him will not die, will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so we believe that we are saved through Jesus Christ, that he's God's Son who saves us. And then C is to commit our lives to following him as our Lord. We commit our way to him. We say, God, I'm turning from my sin. I'm repenting of my sin. I'm turning away from that. I'm asking for your forgiveness, and I'm committing myself to following you. First John 2 and chapter 2, verses 3 through 8 says, We know we have come to know him if we obey his commandments. And so all you have to do is you can pray a very simple prayer following these ABCs. You can go back and, and watch them again if you need to, but simply admitting uh, that you're, you're a sinner who needs uh, God's uh, forgiveness Believing that Jesus Christ is his son, he forgives you, and you're reconciled to God, and then committing your way, confessing him as your Lord, and following him with your life. And if you do those things, you have been saved, and you are a child of God. You can look forward to his return, the groom's return, to take us to be with him, to be raptured up, to be caught up with him, to go to be with him with his Father in heaven. And so it's an exciting thing. Let me say to you, if you've done those things, a couple of quick steps you can take. One is to get a Bible. If you don't have one, let us know. We can send you one or get one to you. But get a Bible. Start reading your Bible. Read in the Gospels. That's in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Or maybe one of the other letters. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the book of James, the books of Corinthians, first and second. Those are great places to start reading. And then spend time in prayer. And prayer is just having a conversation with God. Uh, talking to him like you would talk to a friend and then listening to him as he speaks to you through his word as the primary way as well as through maybe messages or sermons that you might hear and then find a bible teaching bible believing church we're not meant to uh, live this christian life uh, alone we're here to encourage and support each other we all have been forgiven of sin and we're all each day trying to walk with him so find a church get plugged in and grow thank you so much for joining us today 
I really hope that this has been an encouragement to you, uh, not something to be afraid of, but something to be excited about, to be anticipating, to be raptured, to be with the Lord forever. If you know somebody who needs to see this, I want to encourage you to point them uh, to this whole series. They can start at the beginning and watch through this, or even if they want to start with this message, they might miss a few things, but whatever it takes to share the gospel with them. If you have prayed those that prayer uh, to accept Christ as your Savior, or you know someone that wants, will you contact me and let me know so that we can uh, be celebrating with you, praying for you, or praying for those and your loved ones who need to know and need to hear this, and we can share that with them. We would love to do that. And so let me just say, thank you so much for being with us today, and may God's blessing be upon you as we look forward to his soon return. I want to share with our South Bend First Church of the Nazarene family uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the first one is last week I said that I was going to be sharing with you um, our opening date and um, and that I was going to be meeting with the church board to discuss that. And we did meet to discuss that, but we decided as a board we wanted to wait one more week. Um, we, we have a date in mind, but we want to wait one more week because uh, I believe the governor is going to be speaking this coming week and making some further announcements. So we want to make sure that what we share might not be in conflict with that. But we are really looking forward to and making plans for reopening. So next week, I really hope to have the official announcement date. Um, I want to encourage you at that point to share that with others. We're going to send a mailing out. We're going to have Facebook and text and email and all those things. But we want to make sure everybody hears uh, that announcement at that point. Um, but that's going to be coming next week. Uh, so I want to let you know that. The other thing I want to let you know is that um, starting this following week some point, uh, we're not going to be having our, our daily devotionals uh, anymore. We've done those now for a couple of months, and I hope you've been uh, really encouraged by what you've read there. Um, but we are going to start having each day um, some scripture readings, uh, but also some uh, prayer guidance for as we uh, get ready to, to reopen. We want to have uh, that time together and, and the season when we, when we reopen and, and everything that surrounds that just bathed in prayer. So each day, rather than a devotional, we're going to have a guide uh, for things you can be praying about, as well as some scriptures uh, that you can be reading to go along with those. So please be looking for that uh, coming uh, sometime this week. I'm not sure what date we'll get that all up and running, but uh, you can be looking for that. And uh, we'd love to have you participate with us, especially in prayer and reading God's word. So thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we love you. The church uh, pastoral staff uh, prays for you every day, and uh, we talk about you often. And uh, so know that you are you are loved and you are missed. We look forward to being together with you in person again real soon. God bless and take care. <music>